Good morning. How is everybody doing this morning? I see we have some kids here today. So, uh, would y'all like to come up and light the candles? Yeah. 
spiritual community dedicated to human liberation and founded on existentialist and feminist principles. By existentialist principles, we mean that we are what we do in the world and we accept, we accept responsibility for our choices and our actions. And by feminist principles, we mean that we accept and actively support freedom and justice for every person. We support diversity as a source of strength and we actively include everyone. We make our spiritual home in the Old Stone Church, which was hand-built 100 years ago by the African American Antioch East Baptist Church. We honor the labors of love and the powerful history of this special place, which was deliberately and maliciously taken away from them when it was burned down over 100 years ago, and they rebuilt it brick by brick from bricks and stone mountain, and uh, then uh, they were gentrified out of Canyon Park. We acknowledge that our spiritual home stands on land forcibly taken from the Muscogee Creek people, and we support justice and equality for all indigenous people. And at this time, I'd like to remind you to put your electronic devices on silent, please. And uh, feel free to wander around, but um, you know, do so quietly and respectfully. Our speaker today is Reverend Chris Glazer, and his topic is, I need you. When I asked Chris to elaborate, elaborate on his topic, he said that it was about how none of us can be who we are without others who have shaped us, others with whom we respond and react, others to whom we belong, and with whom we believe. It's about shared values, beliefs, hopes, and dreams, or as Chris put it, spirituality at its best. Um, you know, I've always been a, a, a bit of a hard case myself. Uh, as a friend of mine once said, she's a hard nut to crack. <laughs> uh, I didn't want really to be seen as needing anybody because I, you know, I was a tough rod. I could make my own way through life. But several years ago, I found myself in a deep depression and desperately felt the need for some kind of community in my life. I had always been an introvert and I'm perfectly happy to stay home alone, but at the time, I needed something bigger than myself. And fortunately, I found this place. Uh, it fulfilled the need in ways that I wouldn't and couldn't have imagined. And that was nine or 10 years ago, I think. Uh, and as I got older, I became more and more part of this beautiful first E community. I wised up and started loving the idea of meeting other people. It's actually free to admit that you need others. And I truly hope that there are other people out there who need me because uh, I want to give them myself. And of course, as Chris told me, there can be unhealthy neediness, and sometimes it's difficult to know when that's happening. But I think Chris is going to give us some insight into that, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing from him today. If I tell you I need you, do not take it lightly. I do everything I can to never have to depend on anyone, to never show weakness. If I say that I need you, it means that I'm trusting you to catch me when I fall. Um, so some of my quotes today were taken from like greeting cards and stuff, so I don't know the authors. <laughs> so if I don't know, I'm just not going to say anything else. <laughs> Every one of us needs to show how much we care for each other and, in the process, care for ourselves. And that's from Princess Diana. Surround yourself with people who make you happy, people who make you laugh, people who help you when you're in need, people who genuinely care. They're the ones worth keeping in your life. Everyone else is just passing through, from Karl Marx. And this is about the unhealthy needs. Life is like an elevator. On your way up, sometimes you have to stop and let some people off. <laughs> So now we'd like to recognize any newcomers that might be with us today, or if you haven't been here in a while, or, or got a couple of people over here. Would you like to stand up and tell us who you are? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Mercier. Can you speak off me? I'm, I can't hear you with your mask. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, my name is Mercier. Is there anything else? Mercier? Mercier, yeah. 
This is such a beautiful moment. Thank you. Just 
have time for joy. Plants coming up here to help me. There's a rough page turns. This is a beautiful arrangement, but um, a few rough page turns. So if we lose the ball, lose the thread here, um, we'll get back in. <laughs> no worries. <laughs>
or as those who believe in God would say, of us, the children of God. Too often we behave as if we're not attached. Needing others is not viewed as an attractive characteristic, but if we didn't need one another, there would be no relationships, neighborhoods, marriages, families, communities, support groups, political parties, congregations, economies, governments, etc. You and I would not be here. As I try to gather these abstract thoughts and feelings into words, sentences, and paragraphs, and finally this talk, I felt like a barter quarter college rounding up loose sheep. <laughs> Wade and I, and that's Wade there, Wade and I are adding a back porch to our house. I don't think he knew I was going to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> During the pandemic, now our endemic, uh, the airiness safety of our front porch was so important to keep us connected to our neighbors. And several friends screened in back porches and outdoor meeting areas became vital to keeping several families of friends safely in proximity with one another. Believing outdoor living may become the wave of the future, Wade and I wanted an open-air, screened-back porch where we could easily, safely welcome family and friends, neighbors and colleagues. To do so has been a long and busy, noisy, and distracting process, as you can imagine or may have experienced yourself. I am preparing this talk huddled in my office, surrounded by filing cabinets, file boxes, bookshelves, boxes of books, and uh, homey artifacts, and framed pictures that normally hang on the walls. There is a great deal of sun streaming through brand new wide sliding glass doors to look out on the back porch in process. Today, the day I write this, things are quiet, but normally there's a cacophony of sounds coming from carpenters demolishing and rebuilding and trucks delivering lumber or picking up debris or cleaning the porta potty This construction congregation includes a host of creators. Amanda, the designer, and Justin, our advisor, Alex, the supervisor, Sergio and Tony, the carpenters, Gloria and Luis, the drywall patchers, Vern and the other painters I have yet to meet, the electrician who comes and goes, the multiple city inspectors making sure everything's up to code, and the neighbors and their dogs and cats who visit from time to time to review and congratulate and encourage our progress. We need them all. And the workers need us, their temporary employers. We need the neighbors and friends cheering us on. This week, I wish all the workers could come together and construct this talk. <laughs> that I had to do it alone seemed impossible. But then the aha struck me. I never do anything alone. I never construct a talk by myself. There are hundreds of people helping me. My late parents, my siblings, my late aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents, my teachers, my mentors, my spiritual guides who, through word and deed, have given me my better self. But why stop there? Nature, authors, artists, scientists, inventors, statesmen and stateswomen and non-binary states people, world religions, congregations such as 
first existentialist. Every time you have invited me to speak, you have given me not only a venue, but an opportunity to learn, uh, to learn from your tradition as existentialists, as Unitarians, as Universalists, and to learn something of myself and my own soul, my own philosophy, my own take on the world and on life. I need you. I need you. I need you. No wonder Walt Whitman's famous song of myself listed so many ingredients. And so in celebration, and did so in celebration of himself, and by inference, in celebration of all of us, and of each one of us. If only everyone caught this fever, this aha, that we're all in this together, all for one and one for all. Think what our nation's capital would be like. Think what our educational system would be like. Think what our legislatures could accomplish. Think what all nations could achieve together. This is spirituality and religion at its best. Claiming our unity and our universalism, harmonized to meet every existential need, every existential threat, every existential opportunity. Yeah. This is what I think of when I think about God, about holiness, about truth, about religious values, about ultimate reality, about compassion, about being helpers, lovers, and our best possible selves. A couple of months ago, I was introduced to a poem by a Sufi master, Hafiz, in his book of poems entitled The Gifts, rendered in English by Daniel Ladinsky. I'm going to read this poem through once, then uh, we're going to distribute copies uh, of the poem, and, and I'll read it through again. Uh, though poetry was once used to help people remember its words and messages, I find it difficult to take it all in unless I have a printed copy in my hand. So you're going to get a printed copy of this poem. The poem is entitled, I Want Both of Us. I Want Both of Us. So you can see why it fits into a talk entitled, I Need You. I want both of us. I want both of us to start talking about this great love as if you, I, and the sun were all married and living in a tiny room, helping each other to cook, do the wash, weave and sew, care for our beautiful animals. We all leave each morning to labor on the earth's field. No one does not lift a great pack. I want both of us to start singing like two traveling minstrels about this extraordinary existence we share. As if you, I, and God were all married and living in a tiny room. So I've asked a couple of people to distribute the poem and I'm going to read it again.
iniquity. As I read it again, I'd like you to notice what lines or phrases leap out at you. And I'm going to invite you to share what those lines or phrases are after maybe a second time. I want both of us, I want both of us to start talking about this great love as if you, I, and the Son were all married and living in a tiny room, helping each other to cook, do the wash, leave, and so care for our beautiful animals. We all leave each morning to labor on the earth's field. No one does not lift a great path. I want both of us to start singing like two traveling minstrels about this extraordinary existence we share. As if you, I, and God were all married and living in a tiny room. I invite you to just speak out the uh, line that strikes you with the phrase. If you want to explain why it does, feel free to do that just briefly. But I'd like to hear from you. Yes? The, the tiny room thing kind of got to me. I actually was watching a movie. Can I get the microphone? Yeah. Um, last night I was watching a movie on Turner Classic. Um, and it was uh, this couple who lived in this tiny little apartment and then his paintings started selling and they got this great big giant mansion to live in and how, you know, they were really just happier living in their little tiny apartment and I, you know, I was watching her on the movie screen, you know, cleaning up this little tiny place and how, um, you know, I just, I just thought, you know, I kind of would, would like that in, in my life, just you know, a tiny house, just not a whole lot to clean. <laughs> just, uh, you know, everything right there where you, you can just do it all and, and be with the person you love. So that's what kind of struck me about this poem. And also the traveling minstrels, you know, I just, I'm the kind of person that just wants everybody to break into song like a, like a musical, you know. <laughs> I just love it if that happens. <laughs> What strikes me are several lines. One is, no one does not lift the right path. To me, that means everybody has a burden, often in invisible, that other people don't know about, but they still must bear it, sometimes in silence. Yeah. And the other is, I, like, I want both of us to start singing, because you can't have too much singing, except when you want to. I love the line down below uh, that says about the, this extraordinary existence we share. It makes me think of that um, beautiful song that Franklin Abbott wrote and sang to us. Uh, about this ordinary life and how simple and beautiful and sweet it is. And really, if you think of it, we all <laughs> have won the lottery <laughs> in terms of just being able to be on this planet and, uh, and to be enormous, uh, enormous gratitude that one can feel for that. Um, and it is so extraordinary. Thank you. Well, I, I love this whole poem, and I love Hafiz. Everything that I've ever ever read um, by this poet is just so lovely. Um, would you mind if I share another quote from, from Hafiz? Something different. Okay. Um, this is actually on on my um, on my office door at work. Um, oh, and it is in Covington. There's 
a restaurant that has this quote in, in uh, the middle of a sunflower in a beautiful mural uh, on a building in, in downtown Covington. And still, after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights the whole sky. Thank you. I'm struck by the image of you and I and the sun in a tiny room. And that, the idea of the radiance of the sun in that small and enclosed space and all the energy and possibility of that. Even so, uh, I'm here today because I'm lost. Uh, my, my wife died uh, in June. And uh, I moved from Baltimore to where my, grand, my daughter was living here. And it's been a really challenging time because of those things that uh, helping each other to cook and such, they're gone. And it's, it's been a real challenge. Thank you. I'm glad you did. And you know we're here. I'm so happy you've come back. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you so much, Chris. That was wonderful. <laughs>